ladies and gentlemen. The online summit will begin in five minutes. Get started. Thank you all for coming today. Um, it's great to see so many people here so early in the morning. Um, actually, when I saw all these folks here this early in the morning, I thought we were going fishing together. But um, I think it's a tribute to our panelists today that so many of you showed up so early to hear what they have to say. We are coming off a year when New Orleans' economy performed well. But the economy was still an issue in the governor's election, and the race was largely defined by one question. Did the economy perform well enough? Predictably, the incumbent said yes, and the challenger said no. And although John Bell Edwards won, Eddie Rispone had a point. Our local economy lags behind the nation and behind our neighbors, and mostly, it's always been that way. Our challenge in the new year and in the new decade is to see how we can make Louisiana into a leader in times of nationwide economic expansion. For most of the past decade, our economic development strategy as a state has seemed to be to lure businesses with tax breaks. And some of it has worked, but some of it has disappointed. At the same time, we've seen spectacular disinvestments in higher education. But the communities that are booming from Boston to Austin are doing so based on investing in higher education, both public and private. In four days, will show the world that Louisiana is a leader in college football. <laughs> so hopefully, as we start the decade out, hopefully we can start the decade out with a candid conversation and a respectful discussion of what we need to do to become a leader in prosperity and a leader in opportunity. And with that, let's get started. Good morning. I'm uh, Martha Carr. I'm the managing editor here at the Times Picky and New Orleans Advocate, and um, the what I'm looking at um, onto is one of the reasons why I love New Orleans. Um, just lots of smart people who take time out of their day to come together and actually have a personal conversation about the issues that are facing this city. Um, it's just extremely encouraging. 
Um, also encouraging is that we have uh, local businesses that are willing to support uh, local journalism. And for that, I'd like to introduce you to our sponsors. Um, each of them will just make, a brief, make some brief remarks before we get to our panel. First, from Tulane University is Patrick Norton. He's the Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. <clears throat> Good morning. Tulane University is pleased to sponsor this event, and I'm pleased to be here to help represent higher education, one of the city's largest growth industries. Tulane University has entered a new era in growth, and as the city's major research university, will continue to have a major impact on the local and regional economy in 2020 and well into the future. As reported by the Brookings Institute, research universities are essential for innovation, and innovation is essential for economic growth. For example, a $1 increase in university expenditures has been shown to lead to an increase of 89 cents in average income within a city. At Tulane, we recently completed a year-long study of our impact on the city and state. Tulane operations directly and indirectly support more than 19,000 jobs, and our overall economic impact is $3.14 billion. We remain the largest private employer in New Orleans, in, in Orleans Parish, and the 12th largest statewide, and we are expanding. Importantly, Tulane's status as a world-class academic and research institution means that a majority of our dollars, 73%, are drawn from outside the city, whether in the form of tuition dollars, research dollars, or donated funds. At our core, creating human capital is our mission, and we are committed to increasing access to the university for local students. In 2019, we provided $50 million in scholarships and financial aid, 70% of which went to New Orleans residents. Tulane averages $82 million in annualized capital, uh, capital investment in our city and region. In addition to major capital projects on our uptown campus around student housing and science and engineering, we are planning a major expansion of Tulane University in downtown New Orleans. The centerpiece of our commitment is to be the anchor tenant of the iconic and redeveloped Charity Hospital, taking over 300,000 square feet of space for research labs and instructional space. Our growth will bring in more research funding, attract scientists and students from around the world, and will lead to dramatic growth in the city's life science corridor. I will end with this. Come visit our campuses, both uptown and downtown. It's a new Tulane, an expanding Tulane, a Tulane that's fully open for business. Thanks, and thanks to the advocate for holding this summit. From Entergy, we have Seth Curington, the Director of Economic Development and Technology. Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning at the Times-Picayune and the New Orleans Advocate 2020 Economic Summit. We're so pleased that you could join us this morning. I am Seth Curington, Director of Economic Development and Technology Innovation for Entergy New Orleans. At Entergy, we believe our ability to succeed is tied to the success of the communities we serve. This is why we are dedicated to helping grow our customers and our communities by supporting economic development and leveraging our philanthropic and volunteer resources to build strong, vibrant communities. Intergy New Orleans is not only proud to be an economic development partner with the city and local chambers, but we are also proud to be a community partner. Our employees volunteer frequently to support our environmental, poverty solution, education, and workforce development initiatives. In 2019, the Points of Light Foundation honored Entergy with the Civic 50 Award, recognizing the company as one of the most community-minded businesses in the country. At Entergy, our motto is we power life, and we will continue powering life in New Orleans through our commitment to the success of the communities we serve. So thank you to the Times and The Advocate for allowing us to sponsor this event today. We hope you find it informative and gain a better understanding of Intergy and our colleagues on the panel are helping to grow the New Orleans economy. Thank you. And finally, from New Orleans and Company, Christian Sonier, Vice President of Communications and Public Relations. Thank you, Martha. On behalf of New Orleans and Company, I'd like to thank The Advocate for hosting 
the third annual Economic Development Summit, and for allowing us the opportunity to co-sponsor this event with our esteemed colleagues. And I'd like to thank the panelists in advance for what I'm sure will be a robust conversation about what's driving the economy for our region and our city. New Orleans and Company is an organization that was formerly known as the Convention and Visitors Bureau. In 2018, we rebranded to become New Orleans and Company. The intention was to become a more inclusive and approachable organization. And we needed to evolve and adapt as our tourism industry evolves and grows, as well as our city. We did this because we believe that our culture is one of the most important assets in the tourism economy of, of the city. And our culture is created by the residents of New Orleans. Those are our two most important assets. Um, for 58 years, the CVB served two organizations, two, two, get, two groups. Um, the members who host the visitors and the visitors who come to New Orleans. That will always be our primary focus. But in our rebranding process, we recognized there was another group that we needed to focus on, and that's the residents of New Orleans. So now, New Orleans and Company is, fo is completely focused on driving business to our member businesses, continuing to create amazing experiences for our guests, and now creating an economy that benefits everyone, all the residents of New Orleans, from the Lyft driver to the hotel owner. As the industry continues to evolve and our city evolves, we will as well. Um, we're integrating this year to um, include the New Orleans Tourism Marketing Corporation personnel. 2020 is the first year that we will be one cohesive unit in promoting the city of New Orleans to business and leisure travel to people from around the world. That's our primary focus in our daily work. As we continue to evolve, we want to, we want to continue to work with all elected officials, all business sectors, and I'm, I'm happy to announce that we just recently hired Walt Leger, who's sitting on the dais today. He's going to talk to you a little bit more about what we're doing, but Walt is our newest senior member. Um, he is the Senior Vice President of, of Strategies and uh, General Counsel, and he joined us in October, and you're going to hear more about what New Orleans and Company has in store for the future from him. So again, thank you for the the opportunity to be a co-sponsor of this event. We're looking forward to the discussion. So good morning, my name is Jerry DiColo. I am the Metro Editor here at the Times-Picayune New Orleans Advocate. Um, before we get into the panel discussion portion of this program, what we'd like to do first is um, have all of our panelists, um, who we are very happy to have joined us, um, introduce themselves very briefly and give us a little bit of an update on the state of their industries. So um, what we'll do for the next uh, little while is go down the line um, and we'd, all, we'd like um, all the panelists just to say a, uh, a few words about how things are going, whether it be healthcare, trade, tourism, uh, energy, higher education. Uh, we will start with Amy. Thanks so much for having me today. Uh, my name's Amy Quirk. I'm the CEO of Innovation Oshner, which is a, a health tech company uh, within Oshner Health System uh, right here in, in New Orleans. We've been around since 2015, and Oshner, of course, has been around since uh, 1942. Um, you know, some of the trends that we're seeing that we're focused on is one, the cost of health care are too high, right? It's already a $3.6 trillion industry in this country. Um, it's about 18% of GDP, and CMS came out last year and projected that by 2027, it's going to be closer to $6 trillion. That's in part because of increasing costs, because more because of demographic factors, more people are aging into Medicare, um, and so there are a lot of issues around that. Um, the model of healthcare traditionally has been focused on sick care as opposed to well care, so focused on delivering services as opposed to delivering health, uh, and those are those are trends that are that are problematic when you start looking at the cost and when you look at at the the impact of health on communities. So really, there's a lot of movements, and there's a huge shift going on in the industry from a number of fronts. Um, one, there's a shift to value-based care. This really began a while ago um, with the Affordable Care Act and others where uh, wellness is going to be incentivized more so than just provision of services. So there's a focus on health rather than just health care. Um, that has been a slow start, but we're in the middle of that transition, and that's exciting when you want to start thinking about how do we start thinking about preventing some of these high costs and these, these problems that we see in, in our population. 
Um, it also helps us understand that health is much broader than just health care, right? Uh, your health is determined by your behaviors, your social circumstances, um, the environment, your genetic makeup, typically things that are not really part of what you traditionally receive when you're thinking about health. And so um, together with our patients, we need to start thinking about how do we start thinking about that full pie of health so that we can deliver uh, health back to people. There's also a huge consumerism movement, movement at play. People are expecting different standards, right? And healthcare's been a little slow to get on the, on the board. You've seen in transportation the shift to, you know, transportation on demand, banking on demand, restaurant booking on demand. Um, in healthcare, we're in the middle of that transition as well, so really taking heed of the consumerism focus. Um, and then there's a huge opportunity in digital, right, to drive more engagement, to drive more data coming in. Just last year, we saw $7.4 billion in uh, invested in digital health uh, from venture capital. That's growing over time. And then there are tons of new entrants, and now I'll end on that. Um, you know, the lines are all blurring in healthcare. Uh, the actors are now include Apple. Uh, Tim Cook in their last quarterly report said that um, when you look back, Apple's biggest impact is going to be on health. Well, that's really interesting. You know, Google's in the space, um, and lots and lots of new actors. So it's a really dynamic field, and look forward to talking to you about it today. <coughs> Good morning, Quentin Messer Jr., New Orleans Business Alliance. We're the accredited economic development organization. That's a public-private partnership between New Orleans' business community and its city government. Let me try to do three things. Um, hopefully, uh, at least 1% as well as Amy did hers. Let me try to give you um, macro trends beyond just New Orleans, a couple comments about New Orleans, a couple challenges, and then what we can learn from LSU football. So the, the always a sports analogy. Always a sports analogy, Amy. You know me so well. So uh, there are four trends macro. Americans are moving less. The new relocation tests are jobs for spouses. Affordability is driving decisions on where to live. And then home household income stagnates as home prices soar. That's uh, via Axios Cities. So that's from a macro perspective competitively. Let me talk about um, three things that I see locally. The New Orleans brand is as strong as it's ever been if we nurture it. We can talk about that later. The second thing is we are developing a knowledge infrastructure. I can frame out what I mean by a knowledge <laughs> infrastructure. The third, the question that I think is going to captivate the conversation, particularly in this election year, upward mobility. And is the American dream really as robust? I would say that we have some opportunities to really slingshot it here. Let me talk about two challenges. One, I think that the push toward climate change, primarily on the coast, um, the east and west coast, will have an impact on sectors from hospitality to maritime. It could potentially change consumer behavior. We've got to be ready and prepare for that. The second opportunity is really mental health. I think the greatest existential threat facing the US is a mental health. Let me talk about um, four things we can learn from LSU football. And the four things we can learn from LSU football are infrastructure and facilities matter, personnel choices matter, it takes time, and expectations matter. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Walt Leger with New Orleans and Company, uh, Senior uh, Vice President for Strategic Affairs and uh, General Counsel. I want to thank the advocate for allowing us to participate today. Uh, it should come as a shock to nobody that uh, the members on this panel represent the most important economic drivers uh, in our city and in our region uh, and across our state. Um, and it also should come as no shock that the tourism and hospitality industry is a major driver behind uh, the health of our economy and, and the future uh, health of our economy. Um, rather than talk about uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'd like to talk about the great, the, great, the good, and the maybe. Um, some of the greatest things happening in the city of New Orleans uh, right now are connected directly to our tourism and hospitality industry. We're all familiar with the opening of, uh, of the over $1 billion airport uh, in our region, which has uh, opened to great fanfare on a national, international basis. Um, it continues to be something that is extremely attractive deals directly with some of the uh, previous dissatisfiers that existed for travelers and visitors to our city, but also the residents of our city. 
Um, the convention center expansion project. Up to $1.5 billion will be spent in the next several years uh, to ensure one, about $557 million will be invested in the convention center for maintenance and upgrades, about $500 million invested for an anchor hotel uh, that will bring us in line with all of our competitive set across the country, including places like Chicago, New York, uh, and San Francisco. And then finally, another $500 million to be spent in the overall master development of that property. Um, those, are, uh, those are the greats. Uh, the goods are that uh, we continue uh, to compete in an environment that is extremely competitive. Um, one, of, uh, one of our greatest uh, challenges and actually one of our greatest successes has been the development of our international trade business, uh, international visitorship business over the last several years. Uh, we continue to be ranked uh, very highly in an international sense on attracting visitors. But one of the challenges that we have, and we'll get to that as we move forward, is uh, that the U.S. dollar has been so strong lately that it's been more attractive for, uh, for, those, for our residents to travel to other nations than it has been for uh, visitors to come to the United States. And so um, they get more bang for their buck by staying in Europe or in Asian markets. And so we have a challenge that we have to meet as it relates to reversing that trend. Uh, and then finally, and I think most important to this discussion, is um, our need as an industry to continue to partner with all of the partners on this dais uh, to make sure that we have the strongest, most diversified economy that we can have. Uh, Chicago, New York, and San Francisco derive between 40 and 50 percent of their tourism business from business travel and corporate events. That relates to a vibrant and diverse economy. In New Orleans, it's only about 8 percent that we can count on from regular business travel. Uh, and so us partnering with the rest of the, uh, of the great economy that we do have in this city is going to be essential moving forward uh, so that we can have uh, a closer uh, comparison to those other competitive set cities and ensure that the quality of life for our residents continues to uh, advance. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Katie Lagarder with J.P. Morgan Chase. I'm a managing director there and excited to be here today. Thanks for joining. So I'll give a little bit of an outlook of the banking industry and, and uh, similar to Quentin, start with a um, more global view and then come down to here in New Orleans. So um, we expect to remain in our 11th year of an expansion this year and, and not see a recession. Um, and that is largely due to the health of the U.S. consumer. Um, the Fed's U-turn on rates last year really breathed a lot of um, additional life into the economy. Um, and the trade war seems, the worst case scenario seems to be off the table. So those are all good things. Manufacturing globally has been weak. Um, it's stabilized a little bit, but that consumer we see is, is offsetting that. And that's similar to what we see here in Louisiana. When we look across our retail business at the consumer, we see credit card debt levels at a manageable level. We see wages and deposits rising. A lot of that we see, so goes hospitality. We see hospitality being strong. That's such a big element. We see it across our, our branch business and also our small business and uh, business clients. Um, continuing to struggle is energy. Um, it's less bad, but still not good. I think important in the banking industry, and as I talk to my peers, both internally and externally, is to be prudent in the uptimes so that you can be there for your clients in the downtimes. And we're very committed to doing that. And even looking for where we can continue to do new business. I think our firm brought on 20 new energy clients last year. But we don't see it as a place for really large growth. Um, we do see the growth in healthcare and um, see opportunities there. We also see with um, you know, the banking business being competitive, um, with not as much business to be done in energy, we see very competitive um, uh, terms coming um, from, from all the banks, so that should be good for, for the consumer um, out there along with low rates. Um, we also really focused on technology in a lot of different ways. I think we've all been excited to see the many headlines over the last few years of um, direct technology jobs, I think, Michael Heck's update over the holidays, it was something like 1,600 direct technology jobs coming into the area, uh, which has been fabulous to see. Um, and, and we think we'll continue to see that, but it's in its early stages, and we think we it's very important that we think about adding to the breadth and depth of the economy here. And so we're doing that. Uh, I'll give one anecdote, and I think I'm running short on time. I'm getting the, the flashcard in the back. Um, <laughs> 
is um, we have a disruptive commerce and technology banker that covers a, a, a region or in Louisiana and other states, and um, including Texas. And when he comes in, we fill his calendar. And, and that's been exciting to see. Several years ago, I couldn't say that. So we're making investments through Idea Village uh, and Propeller and, 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 and uh, with, with uh, NOLA BA, where we can work on workforce issues and small business and, and entrepreneurship um, to really support the growth where we think we need it in the economy. I think I'm out of time, so I may cover some of the many other highlights I have as we go to questions, but thank you. Good morning. I am Antique Landa, CEO of Landis Construction Company. Um, so I'm pleased to be here to talk to you about what our industry is seeing for 2020. The construction market in New Orleans is a very competitive one. Um, and that's not something that we just feel, uh, those of us in the midst of it, it's actually something that's been noted by national research firms that focus on our industry. We have a really crowded space. Fortunately, we also have a lot of work going on in our local market, um, and that should increase or continue in 2020. So there are the big market anchoring projects that we all see and hear about frequently, the youth, I'm oh, sorry, the World Trade Center, which is um, ongoing, the Superdome renovation, which is upcoming, Charity Hospital, all of these will start bringing um, more and more jobs as we go forward into 2020 and 2021. We also heard about Tulane's coming investments in the convention center as well. And th so those will continue to bring opportunity here locally. And that's important not just for our local construction companies, but also for our local workforce. Workforce has been a continuing concern in the construction industry. There are a lot of people leaving our industry. And we want our craftspeople to see that there continues to be opportunity for them here locally, that they don't need to go elsewhere to earn their livelihood. So that's been super encouraging. Um, looking at some of the national trends reports, what they are noting about the New Orleans marketplace is particular opportunity in the multifamily hospitality and light industrial sectors. Uh, they also noted the Urban Land Institute Emerging Trends Report noted that in 2019 there was increased development investment in our area over the last few years. Um, it was mentioned, Katie had mentioned that we've seen 11 years of expansion, and they talk about how for markets like ours, that duration is really important, and we're starting to see kind of the, the sharing of those investments in secondary markets like ours. So 2020 looks like a great year for the construction industry in New Orleans, and we're really excited to be a part of it. Good morning. I'm Tara Hernandez. Our company um, traditionally does real estate development and technology investment, but I wear a few hats and have been active with GNO Inc. and on the board of the Jazz and Heritage Festival Foundation and found that there's an intersection that actually provides an opportunity for our area, and that is music. We all know and the world knows that we have amazing music here. Um, the challenge is we only have one leg of it. Right, and that's the gig economy. And so we can throw amazing festivals. We have lots of live music venue opportunities, but when it comes to the business side, artist management and the publishing and songwriting, which is really where the basis of the business is in, ter in terms of intellectual property, we're lacking there. But some things have ha been happening in our city that allow um, the opportunity for expansion and intersection again. And that's, we're attracting technology companies like DXC. We have um, a, um, sorry, I'm uh, having a, a senior moment there, a uh, video gaming, um, we have sports, we have uh, music education with multiple universities here. And so, at GNO Inc., we have spearheaded last year what's known as the New Orleans Music Economy Initiative, and we will be, we partnered with local um, musicians basically on the city and state level and have a collaboration of businesses from the banking, from the legal, from the publishing, from the um, actually music side and artists to come together and collaborate on moving this other two prongs of the economy forward. And this goes from the managers to the um, publishing, but also to 
sound recording and, and engineering and some of those other non-traditional, um, at least recognized opportunities. And so we're really looking forward. Um, and like uh, Ernie Cato liked to say, I'm not sure, but I'm almost positive that all music came from New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Good morning, uh, Mike Fitz, president of Tulane University. Um, I have one takeaway from my comments, which is um, universities education um, is important, big business, and has the capacity to transform communities. Um, we, um, as you say, if you read newspapers, you hear about the challenges in higher education, what's the ROI, tuition, uh, you see about some uh, colleges closing across the United States, changing demographics. Um, I think the story we need to take away from New Orleans is the opposite, which is uh, education is truly a huge business and a growth industry. It's because we are about, universities are about uh, intellectual capital and human capital. Um, and that's our focus, that's what we're investing in. And if you think about communities, that's what drives the growth of communities today. And if you look around the country, um, you look at the cities that have really taken off, um, whether that's Nashville, uh, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Ohio, um, what it's been is universities, colleges, um, the, and, and what they draw. Um, and the important part is they draw students, from around the globe, high educated students. They create alumni who invest in the local community. They create intellectual property through research that produces startups. Um, and that has, in a sense, driven it. We had conversations here about um, the hospitality industry. Um, you know, universities can bring in huge numbers of people. Tulane had 42,000 applications this past year. Those applicants come to New Orleans, they spend time here. So it's a, it's a huge driver, um, I think, of the local economy. Now, how does New Orleans fit into this puzzle, higher education puzzle? The important point is we are, um, in a sense, rated the number one college town in the United States by all the ranking industries. Um, and why is that? It's the things you talk about. It's the food, it's the music, it's the lifestyle, it's the gestalt, it's the diversity. All those things are highly attractive, not only to students to come, but to stay and to build um, a life uh, and career here. We have in New Orleans 40,000 college students, which is literally one in 10 uh, uh, residents in the city. That's incredibly large, and GNO Inc is doing um, a study of how we compare to other cities. And the number of academic institutions per resident, per 100,000 residents in New Orleans, is among the top in the country, right behind Boston, this institution that everyone thinks of as a college town, and ahead of Philadelphia and Washington and Chicago and other cities. So this is, a, is in a sense, a huge opportunity. Let me also note, if you look at the academic institutions in New Orleans, they draw students from around the country. A majority of their students come from outside. Tulane, Loyola, Xavier, Dillard. So it's an inflow of incredible numbers of uh, high educated students to become part of this community. Now, we, um, we talked a lot about the economic impact. Tulane just did a study that shows over $3 billion in economic impact from Tulane. Uh, GNO Inc. is now going to do, replicate that for the entire higher education uh, area in New Orleans, and I think what we're going to find is a huge, huge effect um, to that. Let me give you one other quick stat. Um, in a recent ranking, Tulane was ranked 21st in the country in business startups, um, right ahead of uh, NYU, Northwestern, um, and literally, uh, and Dartmouth, and right behind Duke. Um, lots of startups but only a third of them stayed in this community. Um, and what we're looking for going forward is to ways to capture that business uh, um, innovation uh, within New Orleans. Um, and how do we keep that here? How do we keep more of these students here? And for us, on the horizon um, at Tulane, is the downtown campus. Um, we're making large investments. We'll make over a billion dollars in construction investments over the next five years, um, helping to build this, this area as well as other areas, and in a lot of different um, uh, contexts, 
its research, but its research that ultimately in terms of attracting money to the city and creating business startups, I think will be incredibly important, not only in terms of the downtown campus and the innovation district, but for New Orleans as a whole. Good morning, my name is David Ellis. I'm president and CEO of Entergy New Orleans, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you for permitting us to participate in this very important summit. Uh, Entergy is a major contributor to the local economy through its employment of a very diverse workforce of about 1,500 employees, uh, through our work with 896 contractors here in Orleans Parish alone. Uh, we contribute approximately $4 million each year to our local nonprofit partners, helping them to provide, uh, uh, to improve the lives of customers and provide opportunities for the communities that we serve. Our professionals contribute countless volunteer hours each year to activities and events that enrich the lives of those customers. You know, it's privileged to provide safe, reliable electric and gas services to New Orleans, and I'd always thought the college students came here for that, but <laughs> no, no, okay. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and our rates are approximately 20% below the national average, and we're very proud of that. It's a very important point for, for New Orleans. Uh, we believe a reliable electric system is one key to any growing economy here. And last year, our reliability improved about 22% versus the year prior. Uh, and we str we're strategically focused on continuing that improvement through major investments in modernizing our grid infrastructure, uh, and that will also support efforts to become a smarter city. Providing our customers with the highest level of service remains central to our plans, and we're in the process of installing a number of advanced meters and upgrading our web-based service platforms to offer customers more options and greater control over, our, over their energy consumption. We're also taking a new approach to economic development, uh, having recently established an organization that will leverage new technologies led by Seth Curington, you heard from him earlier. Um, and, um, and we're also providing options for prospective customers that will unlock potential growth opportunities for our business customers and as we reduce energy burdens for our residential customers. At the core of our plan is our commitment to sustainability and the environment. That is tied to our goal to further reduce the company's carbon footprint 50% below 2,000 levels by 2030, while still, thanks, thank you, thank you, while still meeting the growth in demand for clean energy to power adoption of advanced technologies like electric vehicles and to support transition to a smart city. Thank you. Good morning. Looks like I'm the end of the line. <laughs> I'm Brandy Christian, president of the Port of New Orleans and president of the New Orleans Public Belt Railroad. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you to the advocate and to sit alongside my partners in economic development and, of course, to discuss my favorite topic, trade. Um, what I'll do this morning is try to give a bit of an outlook of where we stand in the maritime industry, but as the Port of New Orleans we are Louisiana's only international container port, the cruise hub, and we drive the economy through the movement of the passengers of the cargo. And what's important, we think about the outlook and the importance of the maritime industry to this economy. Historically, that is why we are here. It was founded to capture that business. But in a recent LSU study, found that maritime jobs pay about 37% higher than the average salary within the region, and that's very, very important for creating family-sustaining jobs. <coughs> At the Port of New Orleans, we're rather fortunate, and where we see the, the biggest opportunity is really in the transportation logistics um, industry and world. There's been tremendous investment made in this, in this region over time and in the port, because uh, really no other port or region could connect the river, the rail, and the road so seamlessly, and then actually leave our docks and travel south, north, east, west to any location in the United States, Canada, and into Mexico. And the port's new ownership of the New Orleans Public Belt Railroad, which is the short line railroad that connects to the six class ones that come directly to the port, that makes us one of only four rail gateways in the United States. So if you combine that with the port's vast portfolio of industrial real estate, and our diverse cargo terminals, that really sets us apart as a region. But those assets 
have become even more vital, especially in the new Amazon world, as I call it, where flexibility and timeliness in moving goods is critical. And I'm going to steal Amy's uh, tagline, I really liked it, is that it's transportation on demand. So our opportunity to lure business into New Orleans is by having a strong transportation system. And essentially, that's what the port is here to do, is provide the infrastructure for that transportation. For example, Southeast Louisiana is now seriously considered for major distribution and e-fulfillment centers. We are finally on that radar. We've always kind of been a pass-through gateway, missing out on you know, some manufacturing and distribution. The manufacturing that's coming out of the petrochemical industry is phenomenal. It's frankly what is growing in fueling the port's container business. Uh, we grew 12% last year in, in containers, and that's um, before a number of plants come online. But distribution has the opportunity to bring imports into the market and create more jobs. And we just had the recent announcement of Medline opening up in Covington. They are the biggest producer of medical devices and, and one million square foot distribution center. We are finally on that radar. And so that's very exciting because it's showing that shippers have the confidence and know that the New Orleans Gateway can serve their transportation needs. And having a strong container port and a rail infrastructure is much like having an airport hub. It attracts and retains manufacturing, distribution, and freight-related industries. You know, a good example is a petrochemical plant. Their decision to open their doors in Texas or Louisiana, obviously we both have natural gas. That's a big component, but at least a quarter of that decision is do you have the transportation systems to get my product out of this market, to be able to export to a foreign country? So that's extremely important. Now, I could go on and on about the opportunities that we have in trade-related industries, because I truly believe the investments we've made over time are making us very well poised for this new Amazon world in logistics. But I certainly do not want to understate the challenges. Of course, like probably most of these businesses, we have more opportunity and more need for capital resources than we have cash. We have to ride through the storm of trade tariffs, and luckily at the Port of New Orleans, we're rather diverse in our business that we've been able to ride through that storm. But the bottom line is that from a trade perspective, from a maritime industry, we see nothing but growth and opportunity, particularly in our container and cruise business, if we make the right investments. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. So as we get into the panel discussion portion of our morning uh, now, I want to set the stage a little bit and follow up with uh, what Peter had said earlier on in the, in the conversation uh, with a few data points. Uh, New Orleans area unemployment is at 4.4 percent. U.S. unemployment, 3.3 percent. U.S. wages, U.S. weekly wages, 1,095 a week. Weekly wages in New Orleans, 996 a week, though it's rising. Louisiana GDP growth, 1.7 percent. U.S. GDP growth, 2 percent. I think what these numbers show us is that we're on the right track, but we have some catching up to do. And so what I'd like to start this conversation off with is um, looking at, maybe talking with, with Quentin briefly. Um, you're someone that, um, in your role, is out there trying to attract businesses to New Orleans, trying to show people wh what the advantages um, of, that the city has. Um, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love you to talk through a little bit about what some of the sectors are that you're targeting in 2020, what some of the places, what some of the people that you think um, or industries might be here, um, and some of the hurdles that you see to uh, bringing them in in the next year or two. <clears throat> okay, I'll try to do all that in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> no, but no, thanks for the question. Um, I always like to be begin with the, the challenging news and I always end on a high note. Um, so what are the challenges um, that when we talk to companies, I think the first thing that we have to be better about and I have to be better about is really talking to our current businesses that are here in New Orleans. I think we have to get better and improve wallet share for their future investment. 
Um, and we're going to take steps to sort of look at business retention. I mean, you know, I'm, Amy, uh, not only is the CEO of Innovation Auction, but she was one of the founding board members of the Business Alliance, and they're going like gangbusters. We've got to make sure that when they look at capital allocation decisions, and I don't want to get into a New Orleans versus the rest of the state, but they could be anywhere in, in the state of Louisiana or elsewhere in the Gulf South region. We've got to give them a reason to invest here locally, and they're similar with companies across the board. So we've got to be better about business uh, retention. Um, the biggest question that people have, twofold, and I think President Fitz talked about it, is there is an underrated appreciation for the level of intellect and intelligence here in New Orleans. Most times people think of New Orleans, party, leave your care somewhere else, hang out. You know, no one loves sports more than me. Amy will testify. <laughs> no one loves football more than me. However, we are more than just football and great food, and there's nothing wrong with that. But ultimately, as President Fitz talked about, capitalism is about where you perceive you can replicate knowledge faster. And the biggest challenge is getting people to understand that we do have the knowledge infrastructure here. We've got work to do. We've got to make sure that that knowledge infrastructure works for people independent of what war they were born in, what um, body type they were born in, what race they were born in. But we do have that. So the good news, we have sectors in which we are winning and we could win bigger. Amy talked about one of them, digital health. I mean, if you look at other areas of health care, there are established hubs. If you're talking about medical devices, that's usually Minneapolis and Memphis to a lesser extent. If you're talking about pharmaceutical development, you're talking about Philadelphia and maybe San Diego or La Jolla, California. But there has not been a hub established in digital health, and we have an opportunity to win there. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm honored and grateful to Auctioner and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for being the three-time principal sponsors of New Orleans Health Innovators. The second sector is an increased diversifying um, sector across software development, not only upstream, higher value added software development, but also more um, things that can be automated and routine, um, uh, more predictive behaviors, uh, software such as uh, QA, quality assurance, for video gaming and across other industries. Um, the, the, the thing I think that is, there are two areas in which we probably need to do better. The, the greatest asset that no one really talks about here is NASA Mishu. The fact that the rockets that have powered humankind to the moon and will take humankind to Mars are made here. And we haven't really quite leveraged that as fully. We're working, taking steps that. I think the other thing is I really do think climate change. I, 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 I don't. I think that's a great opportunity for us. It will fundamentally change the human palate. If you listen to what Tom Steyer and some of these other folks who have tremendous capital and their investments in Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger, it could fundamentally change the way we eat. Think about what that has to do with New Orleans. I think we can then get in the front of it and show that you can make great tasting food, but it doesn't have to be the way that you normally have thought about great tasting food. I'll pause there. Thank you. Um, we all know that New Orleans and the surrounding region um, has struggled with issues around poverty and un underemployment and unemployment for a long time. Um, and so I'm sort of particularly fascinated, Tara, with um, this idea that we're going to take a sector that has existed here, a natural resource, which is our creative music economy, and try to build wealth around it. Um, and I think, um, you know, it's always a little bit of a tricky topic talking about wealth building um, and how do we um, help our what we have here to sort of grow and prosper. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on and maybe some concrete examples of how you hope to do that. Sure. Um, as every, almost every member of this panel has shared that um, technology is driving the future 
and it's the same um, globally in the music business with streaming, artificial intelligence. I mean, literally, um, it's predicting and actually creating music based on your taste. You may not even know it, but it, it's happening. And as I, as I stated in my earlier comments, everything is based on intellectual property. So when um, something is created, it has value to it. It has an income stream and it creates jobs. And so um, what has lacked, and I like to use this example and it came straight from Big Frida, she has nine years of work she cannot use because she did not properly register her intellectual property. So let that sit for a second. And so what an artist is able to do with that, just having their registration properly um, documented, is if a television show or a movie or a film score or um, to use it in a, in, in a video game, all of those um, avenues for revenue are based on having your intellectual property. And if you can evidence that, what I like to share with the artists is you can make money while you're sleeping mm -hmm. because it is being <clears throat> tracked by blockchain and AI so that you can, and they're getting better at it, it's not perfect yet, so that when those streaming or other avenues are, are happening as it relates to technology, you're able to earn income um, through that mechanism. And so through partnerships with the Jazz and Heritage Foundation and the Business Alliance, we do free monthly, it's called Sync Up, music business related seminars to teach our community about what's happening. Um, and we plan to do that uh, once our report comes out and have additional um, incentives to teach everyone that there are all of these potential it, um, revenue streams and here's how you access them. Katie, I'm, I have a question for you. Just banking often gives you a finger on what business owners are doing in the aggregate. Um, it allows you to sort of see if the strategic decision, are they investing more in their businesses? Are they taking out loans? Are they starting to cash out and sell because they feel like the end of the expansion is happening? Um, you talked a little bit about where you think we are in the economy. Maybe you can talk a little bit more anecdotally about what people are, what you're seeing right here in New Orleans in terms of what the actions that business owners are doing and taking are telling you about how the local economy is looking. Sure. So, um, you, some of you may have seen some of the CEO um, confidence ratings were, were low at the end of last year um, nationally. Um, we've talked about it locally and done some look, looking at it locally, and it's more positive, we find, in, in this region. So generally a positive outlook. Um, I mentioned energy in the beginning, you know, still challenging. Um, but overall, um, positive, and we see them really looking to um, look for expansion opportunities, growth opportunities. A, a, a challenge that comes up, and in, in what is one of the most common themes I hear, is around workforce, and a couple of people have mentioned that. Um, that's a pretty common theme across the board. It does not know a lot of boundaries, although it, it tends to be in uh, industrial, skilled traffic, craft, and technology. Um, especially in probably healthcare, I see you nodding, but, um, and so that is something I think is, is so critically important. And Jerry, when you shared the, the numbers comparing our local GDP and, and local stats versus national, um, that to me, it, it's just the answer is finding a solution on workforce. We have a population here that may be displaced because there's not as many jobs in energy and have certain skills, and how can we transfer those skills? Um, there's opportunity, we believe, in water, industrial construction, technology, different fields, and we're really actively investing in that. Uh, over the last three years, it's been over $3 million to put together workforce programs to try to help um, plug that in. It's right here. We have the need, and we have the people, and we have skills. And we just need to all come together to do that. And Antigua, I'd be curious if you could just chime in there, because I'm curious to what extent in your business are you starting to have to retrain people or upgrade their skills or try to get people to um, to start doing jobs that maybe take a more skill level? Do you take that training on? Are you looking for outside um, you know, colleges, universities to do that um, as you're seeing people 
at least think about leaving the area, how do you replace them with skilled workers? We do both. We lean on educational, uh, educational facilities, institutions, as well as doing things in-house. Most of the work in the field for construction happens not directly by the general contracting firms like my own, but through trade partners, um, the masons, the uh, skilled mill workers, et cetera. And so they focus a lot on making sure that those skills are being developed and there is a pipeline for those individuals. Both AGC and ABC trade um, organizations work to provide training opportunities for construction workers in New Orleans, so that's an important part of it when it comes to the field work and really making sure that those opportunities are there and growing. Also looking younger, there are a lot of organizations, Louisiana Green Corps, Uncommon Construction, who are very focused on uh, bringing it to the attention of young people that this is a very viable livelihood and this is a, a, a great opportunity. Um, that said, it's also a very dangerous livelihood, and so that's something that we focus a lot of training on as well. That's not just you know, the getting the work in place, but getting us all home at the end of the day. Um, there's a mention about, there's a lot of mentions about technology and the importance of that in moving us forward, and that definitely exists in construction as well, and that it can be a hurdle. Um, some of our most skilled practitioners have been in this field for a number of years and perhaps are more comfortable with their pen and notepad than their iPad. Actually, that's becoming less and less true. What we're seeing maybe more is a need to sometimes pay, take people's noses out of their iPads, out of their computer screens, and pick up the phone, sit at a table, talk to one another. So also retraining people to understand that, that personal connection, the sitting down, the working things out, the collaborating towards the best end for the project is a really important piece for people to be adept at as well. Yeah, I, Antigua, I think you make a really excellent point about communication skills and continuing to make sure that people have the ability to connect. Um, we in, in the hospitality industry over the course of the last year have had between 92,000 and 96,000 jobs uh, in the region. And one of the things that is interesting about those jobs is that they reach um, a very diverse audience. We're talking about people who have MBAs, who are accountants, uh, who uh, are entry level uh, individuals, and some of whom are even transitioning from uh, incarceration into the workforce. Um, and so what we've been doing is trying to partner with uh, other economic development leaders to create a business credential that would be um, supported both by the Board of Regents and by the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education to ensure that those very uh, communication and per interpersonal skills are able to be developed by, by individuals who are somewhere between high school education and a college education uh, so that they can not only get sort of that basic um, foundation, but also develop the, the very necessary skills that reach across every uh, employment sector uh, to be able to connect. And, and we've, we're doing that through uh, South New Hampshire uh, University. Uh, which is an online uh, educational platform. So um, I think that the, the interconnectivity and, and personal skills is, is crucial for the workforce development needs and a point very well made. So a lot of you all um, talked or touched on sort of the interconnectedness between you know, a healthy economy being based on um, both private investment and how it interacts with public investment and the taxpayer dollar. Um, and so this question is for, for David, you know, who runs a utility. Um, the Sewage and Water Board has recently come under fire in recent years for um, routine power plant failures, including its latest turbine explosion last month. Meanwhile, Entergy has been criticized for frequent outages due to problems with its infrastructure. I'm curious what your thoughts are about what sort of solution both the utility and city government should be looking at to ensure that the city has reliable drainage and water, um, you know, power to drive those systems? Uh, that's a very good question, and thank you for that question. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Sewage and Water Board for quite some time uh, on mutual solutions that will help both them uh, to, to shore up their, their power needs, 
uh, so that when called upon, they're able to provide reliable drainage, et cetera. Uh, many of you may know that through our most recent rate case, we offered a significant amount of capital that did not go through. It was not approved, but uh, we're going to continue to have discussions with both city council and with sewage and water board uh, to try and uh, bring that back around in another form so that they will have the capital that they need to supply more reliable power, et cetera. Some of their assets are very old. You know that. You read that in the newspapers. And so part of our charge, you know, working with the Sewage and Water Board is to help upgrade some of those assets so that the older generation that they utilize today uh, will be more efficient, less emitting resources, and that they'll take more power from our system. Uh, one lesser known fact is that our system is a very clean, we run a very clean fleet. Uh, in fact, with our most recent filing with the City Council, uh, we proposed a 70% clean energy standard that would bring in our emission rate to somewhere in the neighborhood of the, uh, uh, of the uh, you know, standards, uh, international standards uh, on, on emissions. So we're at about 570 pounds per megawatt hour. Is that right, Seth? And, uh, and the Sewage and Water Board's uh, generation assets are some 10 times that, and we're supplying a lot more power. And, so, and they recognize that, and so again, uh, we all know that we, uh, we need to work together in collaboration uh, because we're, we're trying to solve some of the same goals. Reliable inf infrastructure, reduced outages for both sewage, water board, and also for us. Uh, I gave you a statistic earlier that said that uh, we're experiencing, uh, we have 20, a 22% improvement from a reliability standard um, than we did the year prior. And we, un we will continue that trend, but we recognize that if we want to really quantum leap that forward, we also have to do it with technology. So we're making investments in grid modernizations and employing uh, new technologies like reclosers, smart fuses, uh, sectionalizing our circuits more so that a single interruption does not interrupt multiple, you know, hundreds of people or thousands of people, but we're, we're providing more zonal protection so it reduces the number of people that are impacted. So we're doing a lot of things to invest in the grid. We invest about, today, on the distribution side, we invest about $15 million per year in distribution infrastructure. Uh, we're going to invest even more with the, with the advent of these uh, advanced meters and some of the newer stuff that we're doing. As a follow-up question, um, Walt, there's been, you know, a very vigorous debate going on between the mayor and her administration and the tourism sector, which is really the city's preeminent driver, economic driver, one of them, um, about how much responsibility the tourism sector should bear for the condition of our infrastructure. Um, you know, everything from drainage primarily to roads. Um, to keeping the city clean, things like that. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, over the course of the last year, there's been a historic agreement that was reached between the legislature, uh, the city of New Orleans, uh, led by the governor's efforts, uh, and also the, the hospitality industry uh, to ensure that there was significant investment in infrastructure across the city. Um, $50 million deal up front that, that provided for about $28 million in cash to take care of some of the uh, outstanding infrastructure costs that were associated with sewage and water board work. And then uh, the remainder of that uh, 26, $27 million a year in <coughs> recurring revenues that will be pumped back in, into the city. Um, chief among those uh, and, and among the, the accomplishment and the investment has been the, uh, the realignment of New Orleans Marketing uh, Tourism uh, Corporation uh, with New Orleans and Company. And uh, the, the significant thing about that is, one, it brings us in, into alignment with best practices across the country, aligning both uh, domestic and transient uh, marketing uh, for tourism promotion uh, with the convention sales side, uh, but maybe more importantly, uh, providing about $8.3 million uh, of less marketing dollars to be reinvested in infrastructure. And so the next year really is going to be a challenge uh, as we seek to be more efficient in the marketing and promotion of the city, uh, knowing that marketing dollars and the spend of those dollars is the muscle that drives uh, visitorship. Um, one, we'll be working with the city to make sure that that $8.3 million gets invested adequately in infrastructure for, for flood protection and, and also to, for roads. Uh, but also trying to do more with less, trying to be more efficient, um, and, um, and recognizing that while 
We've also had a seven or eight year run that is, uh, that, uh, of growth in the industry that's unprecedented, that, uh, that nationally and across the industry, there is sort of a plateauing effect going on. And so there is a, there is a ongoing and serious balance that has to be struck between uh, the collaboration of, uh, of city and, and tourism and hospitality to make sure that the assets are in place and that the infrastructure is strong, but also that the marketing and, and promotion activities continue because as those diminish, uh, the direct return and the direct spend can also be diminished. And, and while I think we're strategically laying out a vision to overcome that shortfall, that $8.3 million in less marketing spend does uh, have an impact on what we can do both internationally and nationally uh, in, in the sale and promotion of the city. And so um, it, this is not a conversation that has been, that, that is over. It's one that will be ongoing as we continue to try to find ways to partner uh, with the city, uh, specifically in areas like the French Quarter, to make sure that the that this historic uh, jewel of the city is protected and preserved, that the infrastructure works well. Uh, we've seen lately how, you know, how difficult that has been in that vicinity as it relates to the the health and safety of the buildings and the structures themselves. And uh, and so, I think these conversations, uh, though they've been going on for many many years, will continue to to go on and will continue to seek. Uh, strategic partnerships with the city and, and with other economic development partners uh, to make sure that the city is as attractive for the people who live here uh, as it is for the businesses that we want to attract here. Well, when you talk to, um, or when New Orleans and Company is talking to people that, is, that are um, maybe thinking about coming to events here or running conventions here, things like that, does Hard Rock come up? Cer uh, certainly it has come up. You know, it was getting a tremendous amount of attention nationally and internationally. Um, when it occurred, um, I don't think that it's uh, particularly been a, a steep obstacle, uh, you know, obstacle for us to overcome. The the team at New Orleans and Company, which is uh, you know, uh, about 90 to 95 full-time salespeople who are uh, competing vigorously across the country for business, are selling not just you know today, but they're really selling for 10 years down the road. And so a lot of the sales that are happening are outside of the scope of this very temporary issue that we're facing at, at Hard Rock. But I think the more long-term issue is, how do you continue to look at the infrastructure that exists in a 300-year-old city and make sure that uh, as our hoteliers and as our desti destination management organizations and all the other partners and members that we have uh, continue to try to both sell the city and also upgrade their assets, um, how can they feel comfortable making those sorts of investments um, when we do have the challenges with long-term infrastructure needs. And so those are more the kind of things that we're having to sell to people as, um, as hoteliers and other uh, business leaders from other places in the country come looking to make more investments in their properties that are already here in New Orleans. Um, how do we show them a vision forward? How do we establish for them a path forward that tackles this multi-billion dollar challenge uh, over time? And I think we've had some success with that, but that is certainly, uh, those are the types of questions that we get, public safety and infrastructure. Antigua, while we're on the topic of the Hard Rock Hotel collapse, I'm curious um, what sort of issues this raises, um, just sort of in the construction industry, uh, the local construction industry in general. Um, you know, has it brought up issues of, you know, worker safety, permitting and inspections, um, insurance, I, you know, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on what, that, that doesn't happen every day. It doesn't. Huge um, building collapse. Somehow it occurred to me that Hard Rock would probably come up <laughs> this morning. Um, so we had, you know, immediately after that tragedy occurred, you know, one thing it did right away was remind us all of just how dangerous of a field we work in, the fact that construction Safety can't be taken lightly, nor would I imply that it was on that site. Um, but it, it's, you know, when you're working in something every day, it feels like a norm. And it really re-energized amongst our team, our project teams, um, the importance of us continuing to focus and get ever better in what we're doing. And it, it didn't otherwise have any immediate material effects in terms of how construction projects seem to be getting run and permitted and inspected. Um, the recent 
shutdown of computers at City Hall, frankly, has had much more of an impact on things like permits and inspections. Um, you never will have seen so many handwritten inspection reports come out of a City Hall for years and years. Um, but yeah, it's it, it hopefully will have, you never want a tragedy like that. It's like when Katrina hit, that brought a lot of opportunity for a lot of organizations, our own included. You never want that kind of tragedy to come, even though it can bring opportunity. We never want to see this kind of thing again, but it did bring the opportunity to just reemphasize the importance of that and not take, um, take lightly what we do. I want to ask one more question um, on infrastructure, and then we're going to go to audience questions and some online questions. So start thinking out there if you've got something that you want to ask. Uh, Brandy, I wanted to know, um, while we're on the topic of infrastructure, um, are we investing enough in the infrastructure, not just at the port specifically, but in the roads, the railways, everything that gets our goods, our, serv our goods and such from the port to other places or brings, brings them here. Um, I know that we have um, the Avondale terminal or the multimodal terminal that is in the early stages of trying to bring more people in. So it's another big infrastructure piece that um, may be put to use. We'll see, it's still to be, de to be determined at this point. Um, but if you could just speak a little bit about all the rest, how much more, do we need more? How much more? What needs to be put in? And what, is, what do private industry need to do? And what, is, uh, what does the public need to do? Certainly. Thank you. You know, infrastructure at the end of the day is probably the biggest challenge. Um, when you look at the port industry, we obviously control and invest in the terminals and the water side part of the business. But really, to move goods, it's equally about the highway and rail access. And I think Secretary Sean Wilson is very open and has said, certainly, no, we, we can't build roads fast enough for the commerce that is coming along. Um, you have a shortage in the trucking industry in terms of labor and employment. Um, the investment into rail, it'll shift there. So that infrastructure is extremely important. And when you just look at the, the terminal side of things, the state and the port has invested about a billion dollars in the Napoleon Container Terminal. And as we look to build a second container terminal, that's probably almost a one and a half do two billion dollar investment, and that doesn't count for roads and rail expansion or anything like that. So no, you can never have enough infrastructure, and I think you know the state has talked a lot about that. So having to look to creative solutions, private partnerships, um, that's what you have to do. The Bell Chase Tunnel was a, a strategy to get towards that. So. I think it's something that we're challenged with, not just in Louisiana, but across every state, is the infrastructure of their roads, rail, and bridges. Okay, I just want to acknowledge for our online audience that we received quite a few questions um, from people in advance of the seminar, and I'm going to just sort of summarize a lot of the topics, um, and then we're going to go to the audience, because I'd like the audience to be able to to get involved. Um, there were a lot of questions from our online viewers around um, just sort of the um, human experience, the individual experience of being part of a healthy economy like affordable housing, um, uh, jobs, salaries, um, and a development in parts of the city that have struggled like New Orleans East and the Lower Ninth Ward. So um, thank you for those questions, and um, I think Jasmine, uh, okay, so Jasmine Francis is in the back, and we'll go ahead and start with your questions. Just raise your hand, and she'll bring the microphone to you, and please um, note which panelist you'd like to direct your question to, if you can. Uh, probably Quentin. What are we missing? In the late 40s, early 50s, the city of New Orleans had enormous assets and connections in Central and South America that we never took advantage of, not in banking, not in legal. Who's thinking forward 25, 30 years from now where we should be going? in terms of uh, what assets we have that we're not using. I know with music, that, that's a great start. But what others? 
So thank you for the question. I, I think the great news is that I think all of us on this panel are thinking about it. I think in all of our comments, we're trying to lead forward in dealing with the very human uh, pain and frustration that um, the online viewers. Look, part of the challenge, let's just be blunt, there were opportunities in our past that we squandered. We've got to let it go. Um, and so, but there are things from our past that until we deal with open and honestly could trip us up in the future. And so I think we are doing that. I mean, the good news is that this isn't the first time I've met or spent time with the, everybody on this panel. We probably see each other more than we want to see each other. I know Amy <laughs> feels that way about me. Um, but the, and, but it, it takes that team approach. So you talked about, um, so a couple of things, just in sum. I talked about technology. We've got to figure out how to personalize economic development so it reaches the individual. So that it reaches the individual, and it reaches the individual when that man, that woman, can continually be a lifelong learner, whether he or she is an artist. So the next time Big Frida creates great music, that she's gonna know how to make sure she has intellectual property protection. She's gonna be able to release music in the future because of work that Tara and, and other partners are doing. I talked about climate change. I believe that we've got to get out in front and think about how climate change will fundamentally, particularly consumer demand for companies who, who are responsible toward climate change, could fundamentally affect um, Louisiana and particularly New Orleans. We have a great opportunity in water and sustainability. We can talk about it offline, but I think we're leaning in not only higher education, but Intergy, New Orleans and Co. I think Oshner is also involved. The, the ramifications of climate change and how it will change human behavior are, are, are tremendous. The last thing I would say is AI and machine learning New Orleans could have a great role in making sure that there isn't racial or gender bias in AI and machine learning. Pres President Fitz, I want to ask you to follow up on that um, in terms of the international connections, because Tulane, probably more so than many other organizations within the city, is bringing in people from all parts of the country, all places in the world. Um, talk to me a little bit about how that can help establish connections both overseas into other markets and, and how you see Tulane fitting into that? Um, sure, great question. Um, you know, universities um, are literally um, boundaryless. Um, we're focused on the globe, and over the last um, five years, we've probably uh, more than quadrupled the number of international students um, at Tulane and drawn huge connections both across the United States and across the globe. Um, and it, it, we view that as part of our sort of the strength, uh, ability to attract all these people to New Orleans and keep them, but also send them back and draw business connections uh, long term. And so um, the, the point was made about Central South America, huge presence for us in those regions and where it's been appropriate, we've really tried to work um, with the local business community in leveraging that and our relationships there. We have large relationships uh, in China, which is um, more complicated nowadays, but clearly a source of growth. Um, you know, as an industry, uh, higher education is global um, and um, it, it, it's sort of critical to our future, critical to New Orleans' future. I want to make one comment that uh, Quentin is uh, focused on, which is climate change and environmental. Um, I can't overstate more the importance of that um, for us as an educational institution and an industry. We have the ability to be world leaders. We at Tulane are investing in that big time. And part of the reason is we think it's an area which, um, in a sense, is going to drive the world, and New Orleans can be a leader in that. And for us, that means um, expanding in science and engineering in a big way. Uh, it means in, uh, expanding in business in a big way, uh, in medicine in a big way, um, and connecting those um, together. Um, so I think you know we are sort of hand in hand with all of these initiatives. Great, let's take the next question. 
Uh, this is a question uh, or comment directed to Tara and Michael and, and also to <coughs> other members of the panel. We are the poster child for climate change. We're doing great engineering. We're doing great science. CPRA is doing major work in this area that no one else in the world is doing. And so in addition to music and food, we have other creative enterprises, other creative talents, other creative abilities that are not getting the kind of support they need because they will become major parts of our economy in the future. It was implied in conversations that would we've had this morning, but certainly in the area of all of the creative activities, engineering in particular, there's major engineering in the water resources area that's not being done elsewhere in the world. And we need partnerships between research and the universities in that respect. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I agree. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, um, literally when, when you, for us as a, an academic institution, we, we have to be focused like a laser beam on what we can do in New Orleans, what we can do at Tulane that will truly be a model um, for the world. So we've looked at a, a variety of different areas. Um, you know, we, we look at infectious diseases, um, we look at the environment um, and coastal erosion issues of that uh, framework. And literally, it, you know, it's an area which the world is, um, in a sense, understands um, the importance of it. And we are, as an inst academic institution, uh, it, in, you know, making financial commitments in a significant way. Just to back up one second, if you look at what communities historically over the last 25 years have really taken off, a part of it is how much they invest in research. Um, and, and the advantage of research, it could be infrastructure, but research, it literally, in a sense, pays off down the line. Um, and companies investing in research, universities investing in research, over the long run, drives the entire community. Um, so this and other areas, we're at Tulane, we're um, uh, focusing on expanding our research investment by 50% over the next five years. Um, and climate change, um, health outcomes, health equity, infectious diseases, uh, intelligence, technology, these are all areas that we have an interest, we get research dollars for, but over the long run, they should produce huge benefits for the local community, both in terms of business startups and the like. And if I could just add to that, I think, you know, in corollary to the research part is to really think about how are we investing in our people. And I think you've been hearing that across, across the board, is really thinking about how do we position our community to take advantage of these growing industries, particularly in healthcare, where we're going to see a 14% projection of job growth over the next 10 years. And wages in our field are about 72% higher than, that, than the average field. So how do we prepare uh, our workforce here locally to participate in, in those jobs that are going to be coming? And so, you know, I think um, particularly when you recognize in healthcare specifically that, you know, 52% or more um, are mid, mid, require mid skills um, or higher in terms of what's needed, we've got to prepare for the future. And so one of the things we've been doing is really robustly investing in workforce. Last year we increased the minimum wage for our employees um, from $8.10 10, $8. 10 to $12, which was an investment in our people. <coughs> We invest in workforce, we're training people, we have partnered with Delgado, with Xavier for PA schools. Those are the types of things that I think are corollary to the research aspects is how are we investing our people and positioning the people that live here in the state now to take advantage of these opportunities that are, that are here now. It's interesting that you mentioned the minimum wage. Um, a number of states um, starting January 1st had increased their minimum wage uh, across the board and um, there have been, there's been discussion, I mean we are seeing lower wage growth on the lower end of the economic spectrum across the U.S. Um, some economists are saying that's because some of those wages are increasing. I'd be curious for anyone on the panel, should we be looking at a higher minimum wage in Louisiana? Go ahead, please. Well, well I, I mean, <laughs> sir, I, would, I would say certainly we, we have been for a number of years, and I think you continue to see what the results of those conversations are at, at the Louisiana legislature. And so you see, uh, you see individual businesses uh, like Oshner and like others who have continued to increase their wages, especially at the lower end, to try to 
uh, to stand up that demand. I would, I would say there are other ways that you can improve the quality of life for our citizens that are separate and apart from simply a minimum wage increase. Uh, the legislature was able to push through an increase in the earned income tax credit uh, in the past, uh, in, in the last couple of sessions, which puts money directly back in the pockets of, uh, of, of our working people to pay for things like childcare, uh, groceries, transportation, uh, et cetera. And it is a way that, at least at the federal level, they have uh, continued to try to combat the, the lack of increase in, in wages. Um, the state's renewed focus on early childhood education, I think, has a lot to do with the health of our economy and the ability of our people to seek out more employment opportunities. And then finally, I would say where the state has really struggled and something that we have to find a way to accomplish, and it builds upon what, what Brandy's been talking about, and that is infrastructure. Um, if we can't successfully figure out a way to connect our people to job opportunities in a meaningful way, then we'll continue to have struggles with the expansion and diversification of the economy. Um, and what that means is rail investment for passengers between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. It means rail between the airport and downtown New Orleans or bus rapid transit or some other reliable uh, public transportation options that allow people to freely move about our community and connect to those job opportunities, whether they be in the petrochemical industry, whether they be in the tourism and hospitality industry. And so there are, um, the way that you finance those things is by one, looking at a gas tax, uh, but otherwise they're looking to public-private partnerships to find ways to, to fund these projects as, Brand, as Brandy's referenced. And there are companies out there that would like to invest in uh, passenger rail, in bus rapid transit. They recognize that we have uh, a workforce that needs those things and desires those things. And as the tech sector continues to expand, um, the people that we are attracting to work in those fields expect to be able to rely on, on that sort of transportation option. And so I think um, those are things that we have to be focused on in addition to uh, finding ways to increase the wages. I think though, if you accomplish those basic fundamental things, the wage growth will follow. It's what's happened in other places around the country uh, and it's what would happen here if we'll make those investments. Can I just interject just 30 seconds Amen to everything that the former Speaker Pro Ten said, but I, I do want to talk about nuance sometimes gets lost when you talk about raising the minimum wage. We really need to think about the impact upon small and medium businesses, particularly those owned by women and entrepreneurs of color. Blunt force regulation that does not understand the nuance and how the profit margin of those businesses could be compl complicated could run counter to our desire to make sure that there is overall wealth creation. I just want to insert that. Okay, next question. Uh, yes, I, I've heard a lot of um, talk about investment at the university level and at secondary education level. I, I haven't heard a lot of talk about uh, investment at the high school level and um, getting our high school students uh, ready to take on jobs that are not just minimum wage jobs, but um, the jobs that we're all struggling to uh, to hire within our businesses. Um, throughout New Orleans, there's there's uh, NOCA and there's the New Orleans Career Center, and those are really the only two programs that are uh, geared towards um, being able to have access to students from around the city uh, to get trade education, to learn uh, how, how to work in the energy business, in the healthcare business, in the hospitality business. Uh, and so I, I don't, it's not a question for anyone in particular, but more open to all of you as a challenge to ask, how do we uh, look to the hundreds of thousands of high school students that we have uh, throughout our communities here? And how do we un understand that uh, not everyone is gonna be going to Tulane University or heading off to college? Uh, so, so how do we prepare them and invest at the high school level um, to teach our students uh, that there are a lot of opportunities that are way above minimum wage here in New Orleans and how do we prepare them for that? I think when we talk about getting, bringing people in to do the jobs, we have so many people here that can do the jobs and that are graduating high school uh, without the right type of uh, training and opportunity and education. Yeah, I, I can speak to, to that. Um, 
I mentioned earlier the, the need for workforce, and that was on the minds of, of business owners. And you're absolutely right. We saw the need that not every high school student wants to or, or needs to go to a four-year university, and there are um, amazing opportunities for, for great jobs. So um, we've invested um, over three million over the last three years to that. A big part of that was to Youth Force NOLA, which is uh, an, a program here in New Orleans that places high school students in businesses around New Orleans um, in internships um, and apprenticeships um, in skilled craft, um, healthcare, and technology with the idea that um, post high school, they have a career path outline and they can clearly see. I think a lot of it is your, your frame of reference. You know, it's seeing that path is, is a big part of getting down that path to a fulfilling job at a great wage. And so the idea is when they come out, they can see that and make that choice, have some skills to, to build on. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just echo um, Katie, because as an employer at Oshner, we use Youth, Youth for Soul and place high school students as in internships across Oshner so that they can gain exposure and skills to be able to prepare them for, um, for healthcare careers. One of the other things, and I agree with you about starting early, we have to expose people and educate people to really understand the breadth of opportunities that are available um, in higher, higher wage uh, jobs. And so last year we announced um, that we are partnering uh, for the John Oshner, Dr. John Oshner Health Sciences Academy, which is a STEM-focused pre-K through eight um, public charter school in Jefferson Parish um, that will open this year to help be able to get really early focused on STEM education and you know really with a focus on healthcare. We know that there's going to be a continued need in our industry, um, obviously for healthcare professionals, traditional nurses, doctors, et cetera. But when we think about technology and field I work in, you know, we're looking for data scientists and software engineers, you name it. And so we've got to begin early exposing people. So we're making investments to really kind of get ahead of it and investments in the community to help get make sure that our people in our community can benefit from the job opportunities that we know are coming. Just to jump in there, since 2006, Entergy has invested over $15 million in, uh, to support education in Orleans Parish. And so it is, it is something that is very important to us. And I'll just highlight a couple of other ways that we're, we're supporting that effort. We invest significantly in STEM NOLA and programs like that. We see uh, the young, uh, young people in high school and in early education as potentially, uh, you know, new employees for us. And so we're very much uh, vested in it. Uh, we made, uh, we also created a program uh, recently called Career Pathways, so that uh, 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 kids graduating from high school uh, don't necessarily have to have a college education to get a job with, with Entergy. And so we bring them in for a week. We provide them with the kind of skills that they need to interview with with areas where we, we need new employees and also help them to take, uh, to prepare for standardized tests that we offer. Uh, and, and then we hire some of those students, fortunate ones, come on board at Entergy, and then the next year we're doing it all over again. I had the privilege of, of talking to one of the graduating classes last year, very excited to say. There were about uh, 30, uh, 30 people there. They were among the brightest and, and most hopeful and ambitious people I'd ever met. And, uh, and so that will continue, and we're doing that across the enterprise. Well, I wanted to thank uh, everyone for coming today and thank our panelists. You were a terrific panel, um, and we appreciate um, I should tell you that um, uh, our hope is to make this an annual event. Uh, and that we, this event was webcast and it will live online. And we did this in Baton Rouge two days ago and um, 10,000 people viewed it. Um, so you can watch it in reruns like, like Seinfeld and the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, and lastly, I wanted to introduce our publisher, Judy Terzotis. Thank you so much for coming, um, and particularly to the esteemed panel. We really appreciate you. Our sponsors, Energy, Tulane, and New Orleans and Company. You know, part of our mission at the Times Picayune and New Orleans Advocate is creating conversations, and today is a great example. It's called face-to-face -face journalism. We will really raise the most important issues and make sure we're hearing from a diverse group of audiences. You know, what we do truly matters. Our company made a major investment this year with the purchase of the Times-Picayune and New Orleans Advocate, I mean, excuse me, in NOLA.com. Um, 
local journalism matters. I mean, there are news deserts within this state that you're not seeing local reporting. And we can't be successful without all of you. So there is a subscription offer <laughs> on your chair. If you're not a subscriber, please consider being a subscriber to our print edition, which is all access, gets you digital as well, or digital only subscription. We have 125 journalists and 410 employees that will rely on you to support us so we can do our good work. So thanks for all you do, and thanks for coming today. Thank you.